preterism and futurism. Preterism and futurism. We are talking about the proper interpretation of the apocalyptic books of Daniel and Revelation as found in Holy Scripture. The preterist and the futurist view. Preterism and futurism are actually opposed to each other, but as we're going to find out, each of them accomplishes the same goal, or is attempt, are attempting to accomplish the same goal. Namely, the diverting of men's minds from perceiving the truths contained in God's prophetic word. Preterism and futurism, meant to divert men's minds from perceiving the truths contained in God's prophetic word. Historicism is in fact the only proper way to understand Bible prophecy. We, of course, in, hist in the historicist school of thought, we utilize the day equals year principle, which is imperative in understanding Bible prophecy. Preterism. Uh, preterists interpret the book of Revelation, especially all the prophecies in Daniel, Paul, and the Revelation concerning Antichrist, concerning the identity of Antichrist. That is of utmost importance to understand when we are talking about the differences between preterism, historicism, and futurism is their respective identities of the Antichrist, what they believe is the proper identity of the Antichrist. But uh, preterists see the Antichrist prophecies as depicting events that took place in the distant past, either by the fall of the Roman Empire in the 5th century, or even further back in the events surrounding the destruction of Jerusalem and the Temple in 70 AD. I would call these high preterists. High preterists view almost the entirety of the book of Revelation, except for the last few chapters, as depicting events surrounding the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and its temple in 70 AD. Now, there are full preterists out there, full, also known as hyper preterists, and they hold, they are preterists, but they hold that all the prophecies of Scripture were fulfilled by 70 AD, including the final judgment the resurrection of the living and the dead, as well as the second advent of Christ. Most confessional Christians, however, see full preterism as heretical. Heretical. Most, most confessional statements throughout church history have something about the second advent of Christ and that it hasn't occurred yet. Full preterists or hyper preterists uh, deny that, and so most confessional Christians see them as heretical. Futurism, on the other hand, is opposed to preterism, teaches that the majority of the events depicted in the book of Revelation, especially the prophecies in Daniel, Paul, and Revelation concerning Antichrist, again, it's all about the identity of the Antichrist when we're differentiating between preterism, futurism, and historicism. But they teach that the, uh, the events concerning Antichrist and the majority of the, the events of the book of Revelation are still in the future, even from our time, hence futurism basic outline of, of futurist thought. One, Antichrist will be a single solitary individual human being. Two, Antichrist will only reign on the earth for three and a half years. Modern, uh, modern day dispensational futurists claim that the three and a half years will be a part of the fulfillment of Daniel's 70 week prophecy found in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Three, during his reign, Antichrist will bitterly oppose the saints of Christ. Four, Antichrist will rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, seat himself in it, and claim to be God. I think I have a typological, yeah, typological error. Uh, and five, Antichrist will make a peace treaty with the Jews, and many of them will actually follow him. Uh, this is why many modern-day dispensational futurists always seem to have their eyes fixated on the Middle East. Uh, and especially the role of the United States as it deals with the modern nation state that calls itself Israel. Dispensational futurists will even vote in presidential elections, yet there is uh, some political ramifications here as well. So this is, this is very real as far as practical application of these various prophetic interpretation or schools of thought. Um, people will vote based upon their, their eschatological thinking. Their school, of, uh, their school of prophetic interpretation. So why is it important to understand these three prophetic schools of thought, preterism, futurism, and historicism? Well, because many otherwise Bible-believing Christians, that is, non-Roman Catholics, non-Eastern Orthodox, are increasingly falling into one of these two camps, either futurism or preterism, with regard to the interpretation of Bible prophecy. There aren't many historicists out there. 
and of course by far the most popular view of the latter 20th and into the early 21st century has been the eschatological system known as dispensational futurism. If we want to count books sold, movies made, radio and television programs that promulgate it, etc., this is the most popular view, dispensational futurism. A little history of the Reformation and the Jesuit-led Counter-Reformation regarding the interpretation of Bible prophecy will be of great assistance here. So as the Reformation made great strides throughout Europe in the 16th century, more and more people groups, tribes, nations were witnessing the effects of the Reformation and its principal teachings rooted in Scripture. The five solas, for example, we need to understand what these are, were being emphasized as the only biblical antidote to an ecclesiastical, hierarchical system that had possessed such a strong hold on the continent and its people for near, nearly a thousand years. The Reformation teaching on Bible prophecy. The reformers who wrote on Bible prophecy, and not all of them did, but when the ones who did used the historicist method of interpretation. They saw that the great prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, as well as Paul's words concerning the man of sin, son of perdition, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, presented a tremendous span of time from the original dates of their respective writings all the way up until the consummation of all things. So, for example, the letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, the, seven, the opening of the seven seals, the, the blowing of the seven trumpets, etc. These are all different historical events that have taken place all the way since the first century AD all the way up until our present day. The reformers recognized in Daniel and Revelation that God had not in fact left his people without a witness. We can go and sort of find our place, as it were, in the book of Revelation, and we can see historical events that have taken place in the book of Revelation. One issue the Romanists and their apologists took up in their attack against the reformers was the issue of the interpretation of Bible prophecy. We're going to take a look at that. But the many reformers who wrote about issues of Bible prophecy saw in them the day equals year principle of prophetic interpretation. That's why I harp on the day equals year principle all the time. It's important to understand it. For example, there is one time-specific prophecy that stands out over all others. This prophecy is given no less than seven times in Scripture, twice in Daniel, and five times in the book of Revelation. It is, of course, the time prophecy concerning the 1260 days, also known as 42 months, also called time, times, and half a time. And this is all the same time prophecy. And the Scripture references are here. Daniel 7.25 is referring to the little horn, that is the Antichrist. Revelation 13, 5 refers to the sea beast, and that is also the Antichrist. The Reformers and even those before them saw that this time prophecy referred to in real time 1260 literal years. Again, using the day-year principle given by God in, for example, Numbers 14.34, Ezekiel 4.4-6, 4, 4 and see also Daniel 9.24-27, the 70 weeks equaling 490 literal years. And of course the reformers knew that this time prophecy, the 1260 years, was far too long for any one man to fulfill and they recognized that the Antichrist must be a system rather than a single individual human being. A lot of people recognized that before, even before the Reformation. They recognized that this system would be a religious system, one that would even recognize outwardly at least Jesus as the Christ. It would be a professing Christian uh, religious system. The reformers detected the apostasy of a professing Christian church because of the fact that the Apostle Paul had said about the man of sin, son of perdition, that is the Antichrist, that he would, quote, sit in the temple of God. And, that, and they knew what Paul, that what Paul meant by temple was the church. See Ephesians 2.21, 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, can also look to uh, John's gospel and his words concerning Jesus' body as the temple in John 2.21. And of course, what is the church often referred to? The church, the body of Christ. So the reformers recognized Antichrist, of course, in the Roman papal system of doctrine, especially in their sacerdotal system and all the false doctrines that sprung up around it. Why does eschatology matter? 
Well, the reformers and those that followed them utilized again the day equals year principle, and they saw in the the they saw in them the fulfillment of the antichrist and the Roman papal system uh, of falsehoods, errors, and lies. If if we want to understand why eschatology matters, it's it's because we can find our place in it. We can find our place in it. God has not left his people without a witness. And we need to understand Bible prophecy if we're going to, to understand uh, our world today and most likely what is going to be coming in the future. Uh, what place, for example, does the United States play in Bible prophecy? That'll be an interesting study. But again, emphasizing the day equals year principle Reformed Baptist scholar, theologian, and biblical expositor, Dr. John Gill, in his commentary on Revelation chapter 11, verse 2, writes this, And the holy city shall they, the Gentiles, tread underfoot forty and two months. And this is Gill's commentary, which being reduced to years, make just three years and a half, which preterists and futurists will say this forty-two months should be interpreted literally. Preterists say it's in the in the distant past, futurists say it's still in the future from our time. But notice what Gill says, but then this date cannot be understood strictly and literally. A year of 360 days, which account Daniel used and John after him, 42 months, reckoning a day for a year after the prophetic style, make 1260 years. John Gill is just echoing what was common knowledge at this time. Common knowledge. Lord John Napier, a uh, Scottish uh, mathematician, actually. He was a biblical expositor as well, but he was a mathematician and the inventor of, of logarithms. He was actually quite brilliant, apparently. Uh, but he was a writer, the writer of uh, the first serious Scottish work on Bible prophecy called A Plain Discovery of the Whole Revelation of St. John. And he writes concerning the day equals year principle, and I did copy it down in the old English that uh, Napier was writing in. In prophetical dates of days, weeks, months, and years, every common prophetical day is taken for a year. Later he writes on page 22, Propositions 15 and 16, that the 42 months, 1,203 score prophetical days, three great days and a half, and a time, times, and half a time mentioned in Daniel and in Revelation, are all one date, okay? Same date. Every one of them, 1,260 Julian years 1260 literal years julian years and by julian years of course napier means solar years of 365.25 days each and we can take a look at british methodist bible scholar adam clark and his commentary on the bible and the woman in the wilderness of revelation chapter 12 verse 14 in the 1260 days time prophecy he writes quote the holy spirit when speaking of years symbolically has invariably represented them by days. Days, years. Days, he's writing them in days, the Holy Spirit in Scripture giving us days, but they are symbolic of years. Commanding, for example, the prophet Ezekiel to lie upon his left side 390 days, that it might be a sign or symbol of the house of Israel bearing their iniquity as many years. 390 days equals 390 literal years. And 40 days upon his right side, to represent the house of Judah in a symbolical matter, manner, that they should bear the iniquity forty years. The 1,203 score days, therefore, that the woman is fed in the wilderness must be understood symbolically and consequently denote as many natural years. Again, the day equals year principle. In the 16th century, with the Protest Protestant Reformation gaining so much ground with their biblical teachings, including their interpretation of Bible prophecy pointing toward the Roman Catholic religious doctrinal system as the very Antichrist of Scripture, the Society of Jesus was established, also known as the Jesuits. The Society of Jesus, or the Jesuits, were established as an apologetic militant organization to combat biblical Protestantism on theological issues that the reformers were promulgating from Scripture. Now, this this is this is the important part. This is why preterism and futurism it it matters how we view the interpretation of Bible prophecy. Okay, it matters. We have to understand where preterism and futurism were first really systematized. 
Okay, not that elements weren't around in church history before this time, but but they these schools of thought were systematized in the 16th century. Two different false interpretations of Bible prophecy were put forth by two different Jesuit priests, scholars. Okay, they were priests slash scholars. Two different false interpret two different interpretations of Bible prophecy put forth by two different Spanish Jesuits. Reverend Joseph Tanner published a book in 1898 on the historicist perspective of Bible prophecy, so prominent since the days of the Reformation. His book was called Daniel and the Revelation, the Chart of Prophecy and Our Place in It. Tanner, Tanner uh, traces the beginnings of the systematization of both the preterist and futurist schools of thought. Tanner writes, and I actually I have it clipped from his book right here, um, I suppose I'll just read through the whole thing. I'll, I'll try to go fast, but... Uh, I'm going to stop at one point and really kind of emphasize what, what he says. But he says the main features of that system, and he's talking about the historicist system, uh, that the reformers were promulgating the historicist system, and fearlessly proclaimed that the papacy was the Antichrist. Indeed, it was the conviction of the truth of that system with regard to the meaning of the Antichrist that helped to nerve them, that is the Protestant reformers, to the conflict with that great adversary. Uh, indeed, the learned uh, Bishop Warburton says, on this principle, namely that the man of sin or Antichrist could be none other than the man that fills the papal chair, on this principle was the Reformation begun and carried on. On this, the great separation from the Church of Rome was conceived and perfected. From this time forward, the historical system or historicist system of interpretation became firmly established. It can point to a long line of names conspicuous alike for intellectual power and personal piety such as Mead, Betringa, Sir Isaac Newton, Bishop Newton, Professor Burks of Cambridge, Mr. E. B. Eliot, and in our own day, Dr. H. Grat and Guinness and Dr. Gordon of America. Uh, Joseph Tanner is writing uh, from England. Agreed upon the general method of interpretation, which we have noticed as distinctive of the historical system, each writer has sought to bring fresh light to bear upon the details of it. One great event after another in the history of the world, like the beacon lights that show the course to the mariner, has proved that historical interpreter, interpreters, that is historicists, are on the right lines and has enabled them to discern their present position in the prophetical chart. And now we only wait for the closing events of this dispensation to complete the proof and to fulfill what yet remains to be accomplished. Next, we come to consider the time of the rise of the futurist system as we have now, as we uh, now have it, and the occasion which led to it. The occasion which led to it. So great a hold did the conviction that the papacy was the Antichrist gain upon the minds of men during the Reformation, during and after the Reformation that Rome at last saw she must bestir herself and try by putting forth other systems of interpretation to counteract the identification of the papacy with the Antichrist. The papacy had to do something about it. She had to come up with different views of Bible prophecy. Now here's what I want to focus on right here, this section of, of Tanner's work, Daniel and the Revelation. Accordingly, towards the close of the century of the Reformation, the 16th century, two of her most learned doctors set themselves to the task, each endeavoring by different means to accomplish the same end, namely, that of diverting men's minds from perceiving the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Antichrist in the papal system. Do you see what he's saying there? That's important. That's important. The Jesuit Alcazar, Louis de Alcazar, devoted himself to bring into prominence the preterist method of interpretation, which we have already briefly noticed. He mentioned it earlier in his book and thus endeavored to show, he endeavored to show in the preterist interpretation, the Jesuit Alcazar, that the prophecies of Antichrist were fulfilled before the popes ever ruled at Rome and therefore could not apply to the papacy. Before the popes ever ruled at Rome would be during the pagan Roman Empire, which came to its end in the 5th century AD. Okay, so Antichrist was before that, so preterism. On the other hand, the Jesuit Ribera, so two different Jesuits, Louis de Alcazar and this is Francisco Ribera, 
came up with two different schools of, inter or rather systematized, two different schools of prophetic interpretation opposed to each other, okay? But both, of course, were opposed to the historicism of the Protestant Reformation. So the Jesuit Francisco Ribera tried to set aside the application of these prophecies, that is the prophecies of Antichrist, to the papal power by bringing out the Futurist system, which asserts that these prophecies refer properly not to the career of the papacy, but to that of some future supernatural individual who is yet to appear and to continue in power for three and a half years. Sound familiar? Thus, as uh, this is Alford says, this is Dean Henry Alford, uh, the Jesuit Ribera about 8 AD 1580 may be regarded as the founder of the Futurist system in modern times. Now notice what Tanner goes on to say. He said, It is a matter of deep regret that those who hold and advocate the Futurist system at the present day, Protestants as they are for the most part, and I would include in that those who hold also to the Preterist system, Protestants as they are for the most part, are thus really playing into the hands of Rome and helping to screen the papacy from detection as the Antichrist. It has been well said that futurism tends to obliterate the brand put by the Holy Spirit upon popery. Um, again, you can download Joseph Tanner's book, Daniel and the, Revela uh, Daniel and the Revelation, uh, uh, online for free. You can get it's, it's, uh, It should be online for free. You can download it. Uh, dean or Henry Alford, who was Dean of Canterbury from 1857 until his death in 1871 and cited by Tanner in the above quotation, wrote in his The New Testament for English Readers, Volume 2, Part 2, page 351, the founder of this system, the Futurist system, in modern times appears to have been the Jesuit Francisco Ribera about A.D. 1580. The Preterist view found no favor and was hardly so much as thought of in the times of primitive Christianity. The view, this view, the Preterist view, is said to have been first promulgated in anything like completeness, by the Jesuit Louis de Alcazar in 1614 AD. Even Roman Catholic writers and scholars recognized the Jesuit founders and first systematizers of both the Preterist and Futurist schools of prophetic interpretation as opposed to the historicism of the Reformation. Notice this from G.S. Hitchcock, Roman Catholic writer, in his book The Beasts and the Little Horn. He affirms this. The Futurist School, founded by the Jesuit Ribera in 1591, looks for Antichrist, Babylon, and a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem at the end of the Christian dispensation. Again, sound familiar? Sounds a lot like dispensational futurism, which shares much in common with the futurism of Ribera and later Robert Bellarmine, also a Jesuit scholar, who uh, uh, also held to the Futurist School of, uh, of Ribera. The only thing dispensational futurism adds is its pre-tribulation rapture theory. Uh, the Preterist School, founded by the and this is still G. S. Hitchcock here, the Preterist School, founded by the Jesuit Alcazar in 1614, explains the revelation by the fall of Jerusalem or by the fall of pagan Rome in A.D. 410 or the fifth century. Again, tracing the path of the infection of preterism and futurism into evangelical churches, otherwise Bible-believing churches, is certainly a fascinating study, but for now it should be enough to know that those who are promulgating these two systems, preterism and futurism, are, as Joseph Tanner mentioned, playing into the hands of Romanism and the very Antichrist itself. Okay. Um, again, you, we need to be knowledgeable of these schools of prophetic interpretation. Um, it's important. It's important. God's word most certainly uh, is is it, it it has not left us without a witness. We 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 do and can understand these prophecies. Okay, we need to read them correctly. Um, I was going to play a video clip by Greg Laurie, and you can see who is the Antichrist. Um, that is the title of this video. Maybe we'll listen to it just for a second, and you can tell me whether he's a preterist, a futurist, or an historicist. It's pretty easy to detect, and you probably can already guess what, what school of thought he participates in. But let's just listen. Jesus is God incarnate. Amen. But in a way, Satan will have his ver oh, no. version of go. Jesus, Good. his imitation of Jesus, we have Jesus Christ, and Satan will have his 
Antichrist will have. This man will be history's vilest embodiment of sin and rebellion. This man but this will coming be. world leader may not be what you expect. He won't be dressed head to toe in black with 666 tattooed on his forehead and steam rising as he walks by. His eyes won't glow red. Rather, Antichrist will be suave, intelligent, engaging, magnetic, charismatic. He'll do what no other man has ever been able to do before. He'll bring global peace. He'll solve the Middle East peace puzzle. He will rid the world of terrorism. He will be so successful, he will be hailed as the greatest peacemaker who has ever lived. No doubt he'll win the Nobel Peace Prize. He will be a satanic superman. He will even get the Jewish nation and Arab nations to sign a peace treaty, paving the way for the long-awaited third temple. But behind that is the most evil man who has ever walked this earth. All right, I think you get the point. Um, Greg Laurie, obviously uh, a futurist, holds to the futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy, a dispensational futurist who believes in a pre-tribulation rapture. But you can see, I mean, this is this is reading through the issues of the Antichrist, you can see the nonsensical nature of the futurism promulgated by people like Greg Laurie, okay? Deceiving all kinds of people that the Antichrist is going to be some future Mr. Diabolical, a single solitary individual human being, whereas the reformers and the Bible teaches that the beast that rises up out of the sea, for example, in Revelation 13, verses 1 through 10, is not a single solitary individual, but rather an empire. An empire. That's what a beast represents. Daniel chapter 7, in Daniel in his vision, sees four beasts that rise up out of the sea, and they represented the kingdoms of Babylon, followed by Medo-Persia, followed by Greece, followed by Rome. These are all empires. They did not, the beasts that rose up out of the sea in Daniel chapter 7 did not represent single solitary individual human beings. They represented empires. Okay? The Apostle John in the book of Revelation was consistent with Daniel, for example, when he saw a beast rising up out of the sea. It is not a single solitary individual human being, it is a system, an empire. Okay? So uh, I hope this is helpful. I'm going to end it here. If you have any questions, comments on anything I said in the, in the video, post them down below as always. And we'll talk to you soon. Soli Deo Gloria.